biggest city, the smartest people, the biggest idea. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas Cardinal's most recent architectural triumph, which is the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of the American Indian, right on that mall in Washington, um, opened recently to universal acclaim, but he wasn't there. Uh, his story is that at some point in the construction, he was removed from the project. Uh, Douglas Cardinal is not the first architect who has basically gone broke. Uh, experienced bankruptcy and uh, some professional abuse and a lot of loneliness because he wanted to achieve that perfect thing. Douglas, where are you? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. No, I'll never give up my enthusiasm and passion for this profession, although sometimes it it is a, a challenging profession indeed. But it, it is really exciting to, to create uh, people's vision. You know, uh, architects have this marvelous, marvelous uh, responsibility of bringing people's vision into reality. We're such a, uh, an amazing society and can produce such uh, amazing things, but there has never been a, a civilization to date that has produced such ugliness, such demeaning boxes, and such demeaning environments that people uh, live in, that really I've always felt they were not proper places to live. And uh, I have always felt more affinity to nature. Uh, in, as a source of inspiration for buildings, because I really wasn't inspired by, by uh, buildings that I saw. And, uh, you know, when you look at the Greeks, they developed their architecture around uh, their natural forms and male and female forms, like the Doric and Ionic uh, uh, styles. Uh, they related their forms to nature and our own human nature. I was listening, oh, in the 50s, to a lecture by Lauren Harris, talking about how he radically changed painting. He was inspired by, you know, these very powerful forms of nature that we have uh, here in Canada, and the vibrant colors. And why couldn't, why couldn't uh, I, as a young architect, look at and do something like the Group of Seven did? Why couldn't I? turn to nature and our own nature and our dramatic setting here in Canada and try a new approach to expressing design that was more relevant to the Americas and relevant to our own environment. Like my first uh, building was a Catholic church and Father Merckx had a great passion for the church and my job was to bring his vision into reality to to make that vision, and it requires people, it requires space, it requires furnishings, it requires equipment. Well, why couldn't we design then the building from the inside out, concerning ourselves about the people we are serving and then the overall vision? So why not not come up with preconceived ideas? Because when you, you have a preconceived idea, you know, it... Uh, limits the possibilities of uh, that you can uh, because what happens a preconceived idea blocks creativity creativity has to come from not knowing and when you when you come from knowing it just blocks all the opportunities and possibilities so why not create a building like it was a, a natural organism why not look at each space that you're working with, people like a, like a cell. And why not try to sort of uh, solve the genetic code of that cell? Why not look at that cell and see how people relate in that and ask all these questions, how people function in the space, how people work in the space, how, how the space is furnished, how the people 
uh, will feel in the space, how they will feel emotionally in it. All of these things start generating and forming the space, just like this space. And, uh, and that space becomes a cell in this overall form, where that cell relates to other spaces and other cells. And uh, in that way, this jumble of cells start developing a matrix. And all of a sudden, you start seeing you're generating a organic shape. It's almost like, uh, like uh, an embryo, which starts with a, a jumble of cells. And then there's the spinal cord and the knot of the brain. And finally, it evolves and grows. And in that way, you're living in the question. You don't know what it's going to be. And that's the exciting part. But it, just by working on it and analyzing it and seeing how these spaces relate to each other and how each one of these cells and the shape of these cells will work, you start generating an organism. And that organism is almost like a human organism. It has a, uh, a skeleton. It has an arterial system. It has a nervous system. It has, uh, you know, it, it even you know, has a brain, it, it has intelligence. And finally, you find this organism that, uh, that you've discovered by working at it from the inside out, and you place it on the site, and uh, there it's influenced by outside forces, by the sun, by the winds, by the built environment, by the topography, uh, how the building will sustain itself. And when you start generating the building from the outside in and the inside out, all of a sudden you discover this form that's created. And say, my God, you know, this is really quite an interesting form, but how in the hell am I going to build it, you know? That becomes the next challenge. To me, every project is exciting. Every challenge is exciting, whether it's a single space or a large project. And nothing would ever make me feel discouraged in this profession. Architecture is something that you can see and you can live in and you can breathe in. I just feel, and I've been in this profession 40 years, that my best building is yet to be. And that's why I am so excited about, about just continuing on. And yes, I had a, a little setback in Washington. And unfortunately, they took over the design and construction of, of, of my work. And they had to triple the budget because they didn't have the technology we have to build it, unfortunately. But uh, it'll happen next time. <laughs> Thank you. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.